Awudu Bilahi Mina Shaitan Rajim Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Salam alaikum, my brothers and sisters. My name is Sharia. And uh, I'm doing this video because as a Muslim, it's my responsibility to stand up for righteousness regardless. Um, and growing up, I was always taught to use my common sense. And there's some things I see in the Muslim world that just ain't right and just don't make sense. So I decided to do this video and take it to the people. Now, I'm not trying to give no kupa. I believe that a brother needs to be in back of the podium. But Allah has given me a brain, intelligence, and a mouth. And in the name of righteousness, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use them. Um, now, you can take this or you can reject it. It's up to you. But it is my responsibility to at least put it out there. And what I have realized is that there are a lot of people who feel the same way I do. So my Muslims and brother, my brothers and sisters out there in the Muslim world who agree with what I'm saying, hit me up at the end of this video because we need to connect. Worldwide, we all need to connect. Now, um, though I am a Muslim woman who wears her hair uncovered, I thought about covering my hair for this video because I didn't want people to be so consumed with the fact that my hair was uncovered that they couldn't focus on the content of the video. And then I thought that it would do more damage to cover my hair because the content of the video is very controversial. And I didn't want to be seen afterwards with my hair uncovered and give people the opportunity to say, see, look, she's not even Muslim. And then uh, everything I've said becomes uh, invalid because I've lost all credibility. So I just decided to be real and upfront straight from the door. But for those of you who are curious as to my understanding of the Kimar, look for my next video in the near future where I will be elaborating on that. I didn't want to go into it on, on this video because the footage on this video is um, already causing me to um, separate it into three separate parts because the uh, YouTube videos can only be about 15 minutes long. So uh, make sure you see parts one, two, and three because the content or the information at the end of the videos is mind-blowing, all right? Um, but as for the Kimar, just know that when I'm standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll be very comfortable with the uh, choice that I made to wear my hair uncovered. All right, now before I begin, three things. Um, it's quite a bit of footage on this video, so I'm going to be reading because I can't remember everything and I don't want to screw it up. All right, um, I need my glasses, number two, I need my glasses to see or to read. And um, I have to keep my head up because uh, I have to try to avoid the glare from the screen. So yes, I can move my neck, but just not while I'm recording this video. All right, um, and number three, during this video, I'm going to be um, citing certain Quranic verses because at times... Uh, I won't cite, um, excuse me, but at times I won't cite the whole verse, but you will know what verse it is. So um, since this is a recording, you'll be able to pause it and uh, go and verify the verse or whatever you need to do. All right. So um, now I'd like to begin by um, asking a question, which is the same question that my little girl asked me, which was, how do we know that Muslims are on the right path versus the Jews and the Christians? The answer we were all given the right path to follow. We were all given a consistent message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In chapter 39, verse 65, he says, And indeed, it has been revealed to you as it, was, as it was revealed to those before you. If you join others in worship with Allah, surely your deeds will be in vain, and you will certainly be among the losers. And in chapter 41, verse 43, he says, Nothing is said to you as, as, um, except what was said to the messengers before you. Verily, your Lord is the possessor of forgiveness and the possessor of painful punishment. So we were all given the same message, and we make no distinction between any of the prophets. And you can find that in chapter 2, verse 136. The difference between us and them is that a party of them changed the words of Allah. And now much of what they follow is the word of man, which has diverted them from the straight path. When the Quran was revealed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected it so that it couldn't be changed. And so that the believers could have the pure, unadulterated truth for their guidance. The Jews and the Christians, they would argue that they were diverted from Allah's path, but they changed some of Allah's words to man-made doctrine, where inconsistency is inevitable because mankind is fallible. And history has proven that people will lie and change the words of Allah to suit their own agendas. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in chapter 4, verse 82, that if the Quran had been written by other than him, we would have surely found therein much discrepancy. So now my next question to the Muslim Ummah is a question that Allah asks in Quran, but I would like to address it to us. It's chapter 2, verse 44, and it says, Do we, 
as Muslims enjoin on others to do what is good and forget our own selves while we read the book, we, will we not then understand? We will tell the Jews and the Christians that they are wrong for following the man-made doctrine that corrupted the books of Allah, and then we turn right around and follow man-made doctrine when we follow books of Hadith. It's like we, we have this self-righteous attitude that says, your man-made doctrine is corrupt, but our man-made doctrine is righteous. And that's very hypocritical. Of course, some people would say that it's different, because the Jews and the Christians follow the words that corrupted Allah's books, but the Muslims follow Hadith, which was written outside of Allah's book, and which were scientifically proven and narrated only by the trustworthy. Yes, it's true. Hadith was written outside of the Quran. Everything is outside of the Quran because Allah protected it from all corruption. He says in chapter 1509, Verily we, it is we who have sent down the reminder, and surely we will guard it. And in chapter 41, verse 42, he says, Falsehood cannot come to it from before it or behind it, sent down by the all-wise, worthy of all praise. So as a result of being written outside of the Quran, Hadith falls outside of Allah's protection. And therefore, it was open to mistakes, lies, and distortions, just like the distorted books of the Torah and the Bible. Yet, we took the Hadiths and raised them to a level of partner, to Allah's perfect book. You hear many Muslims say that you can't have one without the other. You can't have the Quran or the perfect book of Allah without the imperfect, unprotected, man-made books called Hadith. Who gave us that authority? Who gave us the authority to even trust that man recorded and maintained the truth with Hadith? They didn't record and maintain the truth with the Torah or the Bible. And Allah didn't trust them to record and maintain the truth with the Quran, which is why he protected the Quran. He knew they would try to change it. They told Prophet Muhammad wasallam, to bring them another Quran or change it, and he said no. He said that he followed nothing but what was revealed to him and that he feared if he were to disobey his Lord, the torment of the great day. And that's in chapter 10, verse 15. So they couldn't touch the Quran. But about 200 years after his death, numerous sayings and teachings appeared that they said were from Prophet Muhammad and we took it upon ourselves to believe those claims and incorporate their stories into the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already made perfect for us. In chapter 5, verse 3, Allah says that this day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Our religion was already complete. So then what was the intention? To try to improve on Allah's perfection? And who were we to accept their claim that Hadith was narrated by only the trustworthy? As Muslims, we know that only Allah knows who is truly trustworthy and what lies in the hearts of man. Just like during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah told him in chapter 9 verse 101 that there were Bedouins and Medina folk around him who were obstinate in their hypocrisy. And Allah said, you know them not. We know them. We shall punish them twice. And thereafter, they shall be brought back to a great torment. And Allah told the believers in chapter 3 verse 119, Lo, you are the ones who love them, but they love you not. And you believe in all the scriptures. And when they meet you, they say, we believe. But when they are alone, they bite the tips of their fingers at you in rage. Say, perish in your rage. Certainly, Allah knows what is in the breasts. So, we may think we know, but only Allah knows who is truly trustworthy. There are some who say that they accept certain authentic hadiths, known as mutawatir, because they passed through such a large number of narrators that it was impossible for the narrators to conspire to tell an untruth. At the same time, such a large number of narrators would have made it impossible for the narrations to have been completely free of mistakes or discrepancies because humans are imperfect and subject to error, which is again why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 4 verse 82, that if the Quran had been written by other than him, we would have surely found therein much discrepancy. The sheer fact that the collectors of Hadith had to go through so many narrators to try to prove authenticity proves the fallible nature of mankind and explains why we have to pick and choose which Hadith to accept and which to reject. The sheer fact that we have to accept some and reject others proves the inferior nature of Hadith. And as Muslims, we're supposed to hold ourselves to a much higher standard. The children of Israel were warned against believing in some scriptures and rejecting others. In chapter 2, verse 85, 
yet we have incorporated into our perfect religion doctrines that forces us to perform that exact practice. They were also warned in chapter 2, verse 42, and mix not truth with falsehood. Yet we have incorporated into our perfect religion doctrine that is a mixture of supposed truth and falsehood. Unfreaking believable. And to add insult to injury, even the supposed authentic hadiths cannot be proven to be an actual fact. They're not the direct absolute word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were not ourselves there as witnesses. And we have to take the word of the hadith collectors who took the word of the narrator or the narrators that the reported or supposed hadiths were true. And we have to assume that everyone involved, including the hadith collectors, were trustworthy, despite the much, excuse me, despite much speculation that some were not. The bottom line is that hadiths are stories that were supposed to have happened, reported by people who were on, who we're only told were trustworthy, and with no confirmation from the absolute authority, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're basically following stories of which we have no actual knowledge. So ultimately, we're following conjecture. The Quran and our perfect religion are based on fact, truth, reality, and proof, not conjecture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 6, Verse 116, and if you obey most of those on earth, they will mislead you far away from the path of Allah. They follow nothing but conjectures, and they do nothing but lie. Those who want to de defend the acceptance of hadith, they usually use Allah's commands in Quran that say, obey the messenger and follow the prophet to try to prove that Allah intended for us to obey and follow hadith. But why would Allah protect the Quran so that his servants could follow the pure unadulterated truth instead of distortions and then intend for us to obey and follow man-made unprotected imperfect doctrine that was open to lies and distortions where is the logic prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought the message from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and within that message are many instructions and commands so it makes perfect sense that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal revelation to obey the messenger <coughs> It was a direct order for the Muslims then and now to obey the commands revealed to Prophet Muhammad and delivered to us through the book. And those are the only commands that we can be 100% certain actually came from the Prophet. Those who choose to obey hadith also choose to obey certain commands that forbid the good things that Allah has not forbid. Allah told us in chapter 5 verse 87, O ye who believe, make not unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful to you, and transgress not. Verily, Allah loveth not the transgressors. Yet in hadith, it says that Prophet Muhammad has totally disregarded that order by forbidding what Allah has not forbid and has completely contradicted what Allah has said. Case in point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala produced gold and silk for the use of his servants in this world and nowhere in Quran does he forbid believing men from wearing gold or silk in this light. And why would he? We're told in chapter 18, verse 31, as in other verses in Quran, that gold and silk will definitely be enjoyed by the believers in paradise. So we know that they are truly of the good things that Allah has provided for us. Then in chapter 7, verse 32, Allah told Prophet Muhammad to say, Who has forbidden the adornment of Allah which he has produced for his servants and the good things of his provision? Say, they are for the believers during this life and exclusively for them on the day of resurrection. However, regardless of this verse, Hadith says that Prophet Muhammad himself forbid the adornments of Allah and the good things of his provision. He forbid believing men from wearing gold rings and silk in this life and said that gold, silver, and silk were for the disbelievers in this world and for the believers in the hereafter. Despite Allah's revelation in chapter 7 verse 32 that says the adornment of Allah and the good things of his provision are for the believers during this life and exclusively for them on the day of resurrection. The hadiths are in Bukhari, volume 7, book of dress, hadiths number 722 and 753. According to these hadiths, Prophet Muhammad totally disobeyed Allah's order and forbid what Allah had not forbid, and then said something completely contrary to what Allah had said. Why would the Prophet do that? Or did he? <laughs>